I'm really looking forward uh, to the conversation that I'm going to have with Edward this evening um, about uh, the Irish War of Independence or Anglo-Irish War. So this is an event that's seen by many in Ireland as a dramatic nation-making event, which ultimately led to sovereignty for most of the island. It holds a major place in the popular imagination and has been commemorated with enthusiasm during the recent centenaries. In Britain, by contrast, the war really has no place in popular culture. It's dead and not remembered. And the centenaries of the key milestones have received really very little media attention. So uh, I think it's fair to say that British perceptions of the war and the role of the British army during the conflict uh, are particularly obscure, at least to the general public. And yet the war does seem to have had a significant impact on uh, British consciousness, on, on Britain itself the, the, uh, the, as, a, as a state, on the army as an institution and on many of its personnel. So with us to discuss these issues, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Edward Madigan. Uh, Edward is Senior Lecturer in Public History at Royal Holloway, University of London. And his research has combined cultural and military history uh, and he's particularly interested in the British and Irish experience and memory of the First World War. Before he joined the Department of History at Royal Holloway, Edward was the resident historian at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And as part of that, he sat on the UK government's uh, centenary planning group for the, uh, the, the 100th anniversaries of the First World War. His first book explored the experiences of Anglican army chaplains who served in the Great War, uh, although it uh, I mean, and that's, that in itself is a fascinating topic, but uh, I think it does more than that. It's a book that's about um, the role that faith and service uh, play in, uh, played at the time in terms of thinking about uh, the intersection of church and military life. Since that was published, uh, he's written on a range of themes relating to the First World War and the Irish Revolution, and he's co-edited three volumes of essays on the British, Irish and wider European experience and memory of war between 1914 and 1923. So Edward, I, I wondered if you could situate us a little bit. So let's start in that way, maybe by just talking to us about how significant the Irish War of Independence is in the context of British history. Sure, of course. Um, well, let me let me begin by saying uh, it's good to see you, Dan. It's good to be here. I'm sorry it can't be in person. Um, and welcome to everyone who's tuning in. Uh, I just I just really regret that I can't see you all. Um, yeah, I, I mean, as, as you outlined um, before you so warmly introduced me, the Irish War of Independence naturally has a pretty major place in the popular imagination in Ireland, you know, so it's seen by a lot of people, I would say, especially in the Republic of Ireland, as this, this great dramatic struggle for independence in which the Irish Republican Army and Sinn Féin heroically won independence for most of the island. Uh, so, so the war was very present in the popular imagination at home. Uh, and the story of the conflict and the wider Irish revolution have been told and retold in, in art and film and literature, and of course in, in song ever since the early 1920s. There's also a very rich historiography of the war of independence. Um, so Irish historians and historians of Ireland from elsewhere, notably Britain and North America, have discussed and debated the Easter Rising, the rise of Sinn Féin, the War of Independence and the Civil War um, since at least the 1970s. Uh, and there's a really rich historiography there. So it, it's, it's big in Ireland, to put it mildly. But as you also suggested, there's a, there's a, there's a stark contrast in Britain. I mean, this is a conflict that isn't really remembered, remembered at all in Britain. You know, it has no place in popular culture and no place in popular memory. Um, so there's been virtually no mention of the conflict in the British media over the past couple of years during the centenaries. Uh, now, granted, we've been going to, you know, through some stuff uh, over the past 18 years, or 18 months, I should say, with the, you know, the pandemic and Brexit and everything else. But it, it's quite striking that it, it just hasn't impacted on the media really at all in Britain. Um, and I would say most British people are pretty ignorant about what occurred in Ireland in the early 20s. Now, that's not a criticism. You know, most Irish people would have very little idea of, you know, events in Britain in the early part of the 20th century. But I do think it's unfortunate because the Irish War of Independence had an extraordinary impact on Britain and on the trajectory of British history. 
Um, hundreds of British servicemen uh, were killed in the war. It fundamentally challenged the way in which British people understood themselves and, and their place in the world and in the aftermath of the Great War. And in political terms, the impact of the War of Independence was, was pretty seismic um, because it led to the breakup of the United Kingdom. So Britain was, of course, one of the victor states of the First World War. Um, you know, the victory came at a, a pretty staggering price, but Britain and her allies had clearly won the war. And yet within just a few years of the armistice of 1918, the British uh, state had been irretrievably fragmented. So just to put that in context, I, I find this really striking. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, concluded at the end of June 1919, the German state lost about 14% of its home territory. Under the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which was ratified in 1922 and essentially accepted in 1923, the United Kingdom, the British state, lost just over 22% of its home territory. So that's, you know, that, that's one of the victor states of the First World War. Now, it's not quite the same as the German comparison. Uh, people in what become the Irish Free State are technically so subjects of George V and, you know, representatives in the Parliament of Dublin have to swear allegiance, but the British army is gone. It, it, it removes itself from most of the island for the first time in centuries, and a new independent army is established. And that really is the fundamental difference between either being under British rule or not being under British rule, the presence or absence of the army. So once that goes, you know, partition, of course, is, is a major point of contention, even in the 20s, but much later. But for four fifths of the island, independence is won. So that's that's very significant, you know, from the British perspective. And and the significance that will play. I mean, it doesn't end there, does it? It uh, it will play through uh, a lot of Irish and British history uh, over over the, the period in between. Right? So it's it's not like this is something which uh, is is a moment that's there and gone. Yeah, it, absolutely. I mean, par partition in particular, um, it, it remains an unresolved issue. I mean, that's I don't need to, you know we don't need to remind anyone of that tonight. This uh, you know tonight, Dan. Um, it's 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 a it's a bone of contention in Anglo-Irish relations really throughout the 20th century and and you know uh, into our own time, um, and of course the the um, Northern Ireland conflict that erupted at the end of the 1960s you stemmed partly at least from partition, but there are other ways in which specifically British issues are impacted. So, you know, the, the 20th century used to be anyway called in, in British historiography used to be referred to as the, the conservative century. So the Conservative Party completely dominates the political landscape in the 1920s and 30s. Now, that's at least partly because the Liberal Party has collapsed. And at least an element in that is the absence of Irish nationalist support. So in a home rule scenario, Irish nationalists probably would have been at Westminster in the 1920s and things might have been different. Now, this is all counterfactual history. But I suppose the trajectory of British history in the 20s and 30s is, is it's of course impacted by the loss of a significant chunk of the United Kingdom. Yep, yeah, Battle of the Atlantic looks a bit different uh, <laughs> if yeah. um, uh, Britain's uh, is the, the United Kingdom is the same size it was uh, okay. in 1914. Um, okay, so let, let's 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 talk a bit about outbreak. Um, uh, so, what leads to the outbreak of this conflict in Ireland in the years after the First World War? Well, it's a good question. I think it's worth going into at least a little bit of the sort of the context of all of this, because I think, you know, even in Ireland, but certainly in Britain, people have a sense that, you know, maybe there was violence in Ireland at the beginning of the 20s, but how it erupted, where it came from, these are all, you know, people are a little bit unclear about this stuff. Um, and it's complex, but it's, it's pretty fascinating. So in the years before the outbreak of the Great War in August 1914, um, Irish nationalists, who are, you know, in general terms, are the majority of the population, their representatives have been seeking home rule. So what they were looking for was a limited form of political independence. So uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party was also known as the Home Rule Party. And in 1912, um, the third Home Bill, Rule Bill was introduced and it was passed by the Commons and delayed by the, by the Lords. So it was due to become law in 1914. 
Now, home rule uh, had popular support in, um, in Ireland among the nationalist population and among the Liberal uh, Party and supporters of the Liberal Party in Britain, but it was staunchly opposed by unionists across the island and particularly in the north of Ireland and uh, among conservatives in Britain. So there are serious tensions between 1912 and the summer of 1914. Uh, Ulster unionists establish a militia, the Ulster Volunteer Force. In response to this, then Irish nationalists do the same thing. So there are two paramilitary forces spring up on the island. Uh, there's a socialist militia established in Dublin in the aftermath of the 1913 lockout. So that's a third paramilitary group. And coming up to you know, 1914, the spring of 1914, things are really tense. The Curra mutiny, which happens in March 1914, it tends to be overlooked even in British accounts of this period. I mean, nothing like this has happened really elsewhere in modern British history, or and there are really no other parallels in Western Europe during this time. Over 50 officers, some of them very senior, of the British army. T technically, they don't mutiny, but they say, if you order us to do this, to move against Ulster, to move against the Unionists in Ulster, we will refuse to obey those orders. I mean, that, that's... That's an extraordinary defiance of the Liberal government and of the, the British military authorities. So that happens in March. Tensions continue to mount as the summer approaches and there's gun running and, and you know, um, rhetoric becomes very kind of aggressive. And towards the end of July, as the crisis in Europe is really unfolding and coming to a head, um, there's a, a serious incident in, in Dublin. So the Irish volunteers have a gun running operation and a, a group, uh, a unit of the British Army, the, the King's Own Scottish Border, as they open fire on a crowd in Dublin, on Bachelor's Walk, which is just along the, the River Liffey. And they shoot dead three people, wounding probably 20 or 30 more. So in the period just before, I mean, the week or two before the outbreak of the Great War, the British declaration of war, um, anti-British feeling is intense among the Irish nationalist population. There's violence in the air and there's a real threat of a civil war. Now. And um, what ultimately happens is that Britain declares war and really within, I mean, almost immediately, both factions come out in support of the government, or at least the leaders, uh, Edward Carson on the unionist side and, and John Redmond on the, on the nationalist side. And there are dissenting voices. There are people in Ireland, especially among the nationalist population, who don't want anything to do with the British war effort. But by and large, civilians and servicemen and people who become servicemen or women over the course of the war are very supportive of the British war effort and the, the, the British case for war, the British decision to intervene in the war. So, you know, Irish engagement with the First World War, unionist and nationalist is pretty intense. Well over 200,000 Irish men serve in the conflict and tens of thousands of Irish women serve as uh, auxiliaries or as, or as military nurses. Can you talk a bit more about 1914 just while we're there? In, because, you know, from a, from a perspective looking back, I think that's quite a hard, it might be quite a hard mental space for people to put themselves into, uh, in terms of uh, how quickly people who are devoted Irish nationalists can get behind uh, a British war effort. <laughs> so what, what could you do? I mean, is, is that about, does that tell us something about an identity that's there at the time? Yeah, I mean, I, what I would say is, firstly, a, a reasonably big minority oppose the war. So you have a block of nationalists who are against the war in a way that you don't really have in Britain. You know, there's there's no kind of um, self-proclaimed anti-war, at least in 1914, um, political formation in Britain. However, a lot of young men in particular are persuaded to join the British Army, firstly, because in the, in the case of nationalists and unionists, they've been they've been acting as soldiers for about 18 months anyway. And secondly, and this this pertains particularly to to nationalists, their clergy, their, you know, their spiritual leaders, their political leaders and other elements within Irish society encourage them to do so. And the way the war is sold in Ireland is quite distinctive and quite striking. It's not generally speaking presented as a British conflict or as a British war. It's presented as this great clash between good and evil, uh, a, a battle for the rights of small nations. The parallels between you know, small Catholic Belgium and small Catholic Ireland are heightened and the war is presented as this great moral endeavor. And really, you know, we can come back to this because it's really important in 2021, but the Germans sort of play into that you know, with the, 
atrocities committed in France and Belgium in 1914 and later on the high seas. I mean, the sinking of the Lusitania in May 1915, which, which you know, sinks, is sunk off the coast of, of the south coast of Ireland, that really brings the war home to Irish people. So the war is presented not as a war for Britain or a war for the British Empire, but a war in which Ireland has a real stake and Irish lives are at stake. Uh, that's kind of difficult to grasp looking back and even looking back from the vantage point of 1918 or 1919, but in 1914, that those, those ideas are very compelling. And, you know, some of the Irish nationalist leaders, people like Willie Redmond, Stephen Gwynne and, and others were prepared to genuinely put their money where their mouth was and, and, and join the British Army. And Willie Redmond has killed them in, in 1917. So I diverted you. Sorry. Let's get back to, uh, to thinking about the origins of uh, uh, the Anglo-Irish War. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I was going to go on to say that um, uh, the people of Ireland were heavily engaged in the war. But in 1916, uh, an event occurs in Dublin, which has a fundamental impact on Irish mentalities and on the relationship between the British state and the nationalist population in Ireland. I'm referring here, of course, to the Easter Rising. Um, so essentially on the 24th of April, which is Easter Monday that year, uh, the members of the Irish volunteers who had refused to participate in the, in the Great War, they joined forces with the Irish Citizen Army, which is the socialist militia um, led by James Connolly and others, and, and Common the Man, which is the, the women's auxiliary uh, group. And they, um, they go out in the streets of Dublin, about 15 or 1600 of them initially, they're joined by a couple of hundred more. They seize key buildings around the city, including the general post office, and they essentially wait for the British forces to come and get them. And they fight for about six days and they surrender the following Saturday. So militarily, the Easter Rising is a failure. And, you know, I don't think there's any other way to sort of present this, this, this episode in military terms. But in terms of the mobilization of mentalities and public opinion, it's a, it's a key turning point. And so there's about six days of fighting. Uh, almost 500 people are killed. Most of those are civilians, but about 60 odd rebels are killed and over 140 British soldiers, at least some of whom were, were Irish. And then what happens in the aftermath is, is quite striking. So to begin with, a lot of Irish people are either antagonistic towards the rising or have very mixed feelings about it, especially those who have relations in the British army. But ultimately um, 15 men are executed, 14 in Dublin over a period of weeks after the rising. And in the coming weeks and months, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a change in public opinion. Now, it's not just, I think, it's not solely because of the British response to the rising, firstly. And secondly, it's important to remember that, you know, a lot of Irish people continue to support the British war effort, even though they were gradually becoming in sympathy with, with the idea of a republic. Um, but what, what ultimately happens is that over the course of the next year or 18 months, Sinn Féin, which had been a very marginal political group before the rising, emerges as the number one political force in the country. So there's this great resurgence of popular republicanism in Ireland, which arguably hasn't been seen since the end of the 18th century. And by the end of the war, um, November 1918, Sinn Féin is a major force. Uh, in the UK general elections of December 1918, just weeks after the armistice, um, should the Sinn Féin party, which is a Republican party, which is closely associated with the Easter Rising, wins a landslide victory in Ireland. So they win 73 out of 105 seats and they become essentially the third largest party in the United Kingdom. So, so to put that in context, the Labour Party, the British Labour Party, which would go on to become the party of government under Ramsay MacDonald in 1923, they won 57 seats in the same election. So 73 seats, it's, it's massive. I mean, it, they completely wipe out the more moderate Irish parliamentary party. And essentially what happens is that the Sinn Féin candidates say, we're not going to take our seats from Westminster. We have a mandate from the Irish people to establish an independent parliament in, in Ireland and an independent republic. And that's what we're going to do. And in January, 1919, uh, those of the, the candidates who are uh, at large and not on the run or not in jail, including, um, you know, some key figures who would go on to become important in the, in the revolution. They meet in Dublin, this is the 21st of January, 1919. And it's, this is the first sitting of what becomes known as Dáil Éireann or Assembly of Ireland. Now, on the same day, um, members of the Irish volunteers um, ambush and attack uh, a small group of uh, men from the Royal Irish Constabulary, 
who are carrying a, a consignment of explosives in, in Tipperary, and they shoot two of them dead. So that event is usually seen as the first day, the first event of the Irish War of Independence. So then you've got a period where you've got um, these sort of sporadic acts of violence. I mean, actually of a sort that you might have seen across quite a lot of Europe uh, at this point and uh, uh, in other places around the world. How do, how do we get from these sporadic acts of violence to something that looks much more like a, uh, a full-blown war? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a good question. If, if you look at the deaths that occur year by year, 1919, 1920, 1921. I mean, some of the acts of violence committed in 1919 are, are, are vicious and, 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 you know, terrible for the, the families of the men involved and, you know, were, were, were certainly violent, but compared to what comes later, violence in 1919 is fairly minimal and, and it's certainly sporadic. So, you know, the, the killings in Salah Hedbeg in, in Tipperary, they occur in January. Um, there's another, there's an assassination of um, a royal magistrate in the west of Ireland in March. Uh, in May, the IRA um, cap, uh, rescue one of their, their comrades from a train in, in, in Limerick and uh, an RIC officer is shot dead. So there, there's these kind of sporadic moments of violence. But essentially what the IRA is doing over the course of 1919 is targeting the Royal Irish Constabulary, uh, government agents or senior plainclothes officers of the Dublin Metropolitan Police and the Royal Irish Constabulary and the personnel associated with the British state, so judges and so forth. And particularly really the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, because this is seen as, a, as an arm of the state. Um, and it is essentially a paramilitary police force in that it's organised along military lines. It's armed in a way that the police force obviously in Britain isn't armed. And, you know, when you have, they, they're, they're housed in barracks and so forth. But really before the Great War, before this period, the men who joined the Royal Irish Constabulary, you know, outside the, the cities, um, you know, they, they didn't really deal with much crime and they certainly weren't faced with uh, a popular insurgency. So, you know, the, the, they're really overwhelmed by this over the course of 1919. And by the end of 1919, morale in the Royal Irish Constabulary is really... Um, has hit rock bottom. You know, it's very, it's very low. Um, men are resigning, um, either because they fear for their lives, or because they're in sympathy with the with the Republican Revolution. So what what then happens is that um, in 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 the British government in, in in Dublin and the authorities in London decide, well, we don't want to deploy the regular army because you know this we can't dignify this rebellion. Um, by uh, using units of the regular forces. So um, early in, in 1920, uh, plans are laid to, to deploy uh, paramilitary units. The first of these, the Black and Tans, are deployed in March, or they begin sending them to Ireland in March. Uh, Isabel, if you can show us the first image there, or at least, sorry, excuse me, the second image. Yeah, so so this is um this is quite a good photograph of your you know a, a group of black and tans taken reasonably late in the war, nineteen twenty one. You can see they're wearing these distinctive Glengarry caps and um, you know bandoliers and uh, dark green police uniforms. Uh, to begin with, they sort of mixed and match police uniforms and khaki uh, army uniforms, and they became known as the the black and tans. Ultimately, about ten thousand of them are sent to Ireland or deployed in different parts of Ireland as reinforcements for the Royal Irish Constabulary to sort of help the RIC combat the IRA campaign. Then over the summer of 1920, another unit, another formation, the um, Auxiliary Division of the RIC, which is composed exclusively of, of ex-officers, men who'd served as officers during the Great War, they're deployed as well. They number about 5,000. Um, Isabel, if you could show us the third image, and you, this is a very kind of, yeah, representative image taken also quite late in the war. That's Amian Street Station, now Connolly Station in Dublin. And outside it, you, outside the station, you can see a group of um, men of the Auxiliary Division, Augsies as they were known, in, in a crossley tender. So they, they, they drove around the country and around the cities in these cars and with a very aggressive unit of, of ex-officers. They were referred to occasionally as a corps d'elite, but, you know, they... 
Some of them um, had uh, very good war records. They'd served in um, France and Belgium and elsewhere during the war. But a, a huge number of them had served, you know, in the Royal Navy or in the Royal Flying Corps and didn't have a huge amount of infantry experience. Um, so while they were certainly committed, um, they, you know, they weren't necessarily trained for guerrilla warfare. So once these two groups have been deployed, heavily deployed, and the IRA have continued to train and, and start breaking up into flying columns, by the end of the summer of 1920, violence has become much more intense. And by the autumn of 1920, you know, dozens of people are being killed each week. Uh, and essentially in, in Dublin and the southwest in Munster and the counties of Tipperary, Cork, Limerick, Kerry, a, a full scale guerrilla war has broken out. Thank you, Isabel. So could we just talk, I mean, uh, let's just, because uh, uh, you sort of raised this point about um, veterans. Is this, a, is this a veteran on veteran conflict? Are there veterans uh, of the Great War on both sides? Yeah, I, in brief, yes. Um, but there are significantly more uh, in the British forces, of course, as you would expect. To me, this is a really interesting question because traditionally in Ireland, um, people tended to either commemorate the men who fought against the British forces on Easter week, 1916, or during the War of Independence, or they commemorated the men who served with the British forces during the war. And the and Unionists, of course, in Northern Ireland and elsewhere were always very, very comfortable and indeed proud to, to commemorate in the way that people commemorate in Britain. So one group was invariably commemorated at the expense of the other, but actually there's a significant enough overlap. So well over 120 veterans of the Great War who'd served in the British forces during the war also went home then and, and joined the IRA. Now 120 is tiny if you consider it in proportion to the 200,000 who served. But if you consider that somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 men in total were active in the IRA, and maybe about 2,500 of them were very seriously active in the IRA in 20 and 21, that's actually a significant number. And some of the more prominent figures, men like Tom Barry, who commanded the West Corps Brigade of the IRA and was one of the more successful commanders. You know, he'd served in the Royal Artillery for three years during the war. Um, Emmett Dalton had been an officer in the uh, 16th Division on the Western Front. He'd been awarded the Military Cross. He was one of, you know, he was one of Collins's key figures in, Michael Collins's key figures in, in the IRA in, in Dublin. Um, Erskine Childers had served as a naval av aviator during the war. Um, Robert Barton, who was a key Sinn Féin activist uh, and representative during this period and one of the negotiators of the treaty, he'd served in the, in the 16th Division as well. And, and you come across, you know, the, if you read sources from the period, you come across references to men who were clearly ex-army. So I wouldn't say it's veteran against veteran in the way that paramilitary violence in Central Europe was, let's say in Silesia or other parts of Eastern Europe. But, it, but there were definitely, you know, because a lot of the IRA men hadn't served in the, in the Great War, but some clearly had. And, and that, that experience, I think, was valued to a degree anyway by the IRA. Fascinating uh, comparison. Um, okay, so can we talk a little bit about how the conflict was perceived across the Irish Sea in Britain? Yeah, well, I, I mean, to me, this is um, this is something I find endlessly fascinating, and it's where I, it's one of the reasons I first started exploring this whole issue of of, of Britain and Ireland in, in twenty and twenty one. As you know, um, in nineteen fourteen, if we go back to the beginning of the Great War. Uh, Britain was one of the, well, was the only belligerent state in Europe, at least, that had no system of military conscription. It was also one of the few that wasn't invaded, at least it was the only Western state that wasn't invaded. So uh, Belgium was invaded and overrun, uh, a se section of France was invaded, and we tend to forget this in Britain and Ireland, but Ger Germany was, of course, invaded in 1914 and occupied too. So men could not be required to fight legally, and the war could not be defended, well, plausibly presented, as a defensive conflict. Also, I would say that the United Kingdom in the summer of 1914 was more divided socially and culturally than it had been at any point since its inception in, in 1800. So all of these things meant that the war really had to be sold as a moral endeavor, as a war that was worth fighting and worth winning for moral reasons. Now, the German violation of Belgian neutrality was, was fundamental to that. It gave the, the British government a legal casus belli, you know, a, a pretext to declare war, a reason to declare war. But really, it was the atrocities committed by German soldiers in France and Belgium in the first six weeks of the invasion 
that you know allowed commentators in Britain, and not just the government, not just recruiting sergeants, but you know clergymen, journalists, women's leaders, trade unionists, people from all levels of society, to present the war as this great clash between good and evil. And then, of course, that message, that narrative was reinforced when British civilians were killed in December 1914 during the bombardment of the northeast coast towns and, um, you know, uh, Hartlepool, which has been in the news recently, of course, uh, Grim, um, uh, Hartlepool, uh, Scarborough and um, Grimsby. So, you know, the, the vision of Germany as this Hunnish violent element that, you know, this, this force of depravity that had to be stopped was that was deeply entrenched in the early part of the war. The sinking of the Lusitania, the airship raids, the U-boat attacks, the execution of Edith Cavill in 1915, all of these things reinforced this idea that British soldiers represent good in the world. The German soldier represents the opposite of all that. The German service man is the sort of person who commits atrocities, who attacks civilians, who wrecks civilian property, who wantonly destroys things. So that's important during the war for, for mobilization, for cultural mobilization, mobilizing mentalities. And then, and this to me is fascinating, it becomes arguably all the more important after the war ends in order to help people come to terms with the staggering loss of life during the conflict. So about 780,000 men from Britain and Ireland were killed between the outbreak of war in 1914 and the armistice in 1918. And that's, a, that's an extraordinary tide of grief. You know, it's unprecedented losses in, in modern British history. Um, and one of the ways people come to terms with this is by, is by telling themselves, my son, my husband, my brother died for a purpose. He died for a reason. He died in a war that was worth fighting. I mean, it's, it's up there on the cenotaph in, in Whitehall, the glorious dead, which of course suggests that the conflict was glorious in some, in some sense. So the dead are redeemed by victory, by the, the idea that this great evil has been defeated. That, that the vision of a great evil rested on the idea that British servicemen did the right thing, German servicemen committed atrocities. When in 1920 and 21, especially from the autumn of 1921, 1920, excuse me, onwards, it seems as though British servicemen are doing the same thing in Ireland as Germans had done in, in Belgium and France in 1914. This is deeply disturbing. So, you know, atrocities are committed, civilians are killed by regular forces, but mostly by the paramilitaries in Ireland from, you know, from 1920 onwards. And there are even some killings in 1919 or harassment. But really, this becomes a, a weekly occurrence, a very regular occurrence from the autumn of 1920 onwards. And after uh, something called the sack of Balbriggan in September 1920, you know, this, it, it, this becomes something that simply won't go away in the British media, in the Houses of Parliament, in the general you know, national discourse in Britain, reprisals, the idea of uh, taking revenge for IRA attacks on just the, the open civilian population, this becomes a really contentious point of discussion. And what's striking is that it, it's, it's almost like a wave of protest. You, you would expect criticism of the British forces to come perhaps from the labor movement. You'd expect it to come from British people of Irish descent. You'd expect it to come from the left generally, but it, it's really across the board. So, um, Virtually all newspapers, except the Morning Post, which is quite which is quite pro-government, um, are critical of uh, reprisals. And what, what's striking is is the frequency with which they evoke Belgium and France in 1914. They say this is the sort of thing uh, we fought over which we fought the First World War. It was for this that we that all of those men died between 1914 and 1918. And I'll just read you a quotation uh, from a. Um, a debate in the Commons in 1920. Uh, Joseph Kenworthy, who was a Liberal MP and a former naval officer who'd served in the Mediterranean during the Great War, he, he made quite a, an impassioned intervention in a, um, a debate on reprisals in the, in the Commons. This is what he had to say. In Germany, the excesses in Belgium were excused in the Reichstag by stories of the Belgians firing from their houses on the brave German troops. The same defense is being, ma being made by the government today for this system of burnings in Ireland. If we do not condemn it, we shall be as guilty as the German people and worse. This house may not condemn it, but I hope the people outside will. If not, then Germany will have won the war. The Prussian spirit will have entered into us. 
The Prussian spirit at last will be triumphant and the 800,000, the flower of our race, who lie buried in the score of battlefronts will really have died in vain. And Germany has won and we have lost. So that's really striking stuff. Now, Kenworthy is, is quite hyperbolic in his statements, but you know he's supported by people like Herbert Asquith and um, uh, Henderson, you know, the, the, the former leader of the Labour Party, both of whom had lost sons during the war, I, I, you know, coincidentally enough, on the same day in the same sector, um, who come out and, you know, th th they have a similar position, which is that this undermines the losses of the Great War. And that's, that's just unacceptable in 1920, 1921. Oh, I've got lo lots of questions uh, uh, to come out of that, but I just want to, before we get on to some questions from the audience, um, could we just talk a little bit about the role of the, of the British Army? Um, sure. So talk yeah, to us a little I mean, bit about that and maybe maybe much. what the experience was like for, for, for junior army officers, for rank and file soldiers. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of important to just clarify that, you know, the, the British Army are... are used the units of the British Army act in support of the Royal Irish Constabulary and later you know the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries throughout the war but they're not formally deployed or heavily deployed really until about the last six months six or seven months of the conflict so the the, the British authorities have avoided introducing martial law as you know for as long as possible partly because martial law they know will be hugely unpopular in Ireland but also unpopular in Britain but perhaps more importantly, because introducing martial law legitimizes the IRA campaign. It, it essentially says this is an enemy that has to be, you know, has to be contained by using the regular military. But they do this in December uh, 1920 after uh, Bloody Sunday happens towards the end of November. And the following weekend, there's a, a, a big ambush in West Cork. It's known as the Kilmichael ambush in which 18 auxiliaries are killed. So you know, it's two particularly violent episodes. Um, officers are killed in the morning of Bloody Sunday, and you know that this causes consternation in Britain. So, anyway, um, martial law is introduced, and from this point on, you know, men from English, Welsh, uh, Scottish regiments are are heavily deployed, and it's it's fascinating. I, I'd encourage anyone who's interested to read the work of William Sheehan, who wrote a hard local war. Um, about 10 years ago, which looked specifically at the army during this period. Uh, William Cout, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, K-A-U-T-T, -T, um, who's an American author, but a good commentator on Irish affairs during this period, has written about the army experience. There's an excellent book by Dahi O'Curran and Yunan O'Halpin, The Dead of the Irish Revolution, which looks at all of the individual killings. And there are about two and a half thousand civilians, uh, British forces and um, IRA during this period. What I would say, though, is that there's no uniform experience and there's no uniform opinion. And I think on balance, officers tend to think, well, why has martial law been partially introduced? Either let us really hammer the enemy or let us leave Ireland to the Irish. So we'll do one thing or the other, because this half-hearted, I should clarify, martial law was only introduced in Munster, which is the province in the, in the south. Um, among the rank and file, there's a, a really uh, a remarkable kind of variety of opinion. Um, in, the, in the regimental newspapers, which continue the tradition, the, the wartime tradition of trench journals, there's a lot of humor and, you know, there's this sense that this is an awful posting, but, you know, it's, it's better than some wars, you know, so we may as well make the most of it. Um, there's also bitterness, though. We, we get bitterness towards the IRA and bitterness towards the, the local population. But in un some unusual cases, there's... Yeah, there's a sort of an understanding of what Irish people are, are struggling for. I just want to refer to, to one particular incident, because I think it's, it's revealing in some ways. Um, Isabel, can you show us um, image nine? So, so this is a, a painting by John Lavery of a man called Geoffrey Lee Compton Smith. He'd served in the Royal Welsh, of, Welsh Fusiliers during the war. He came from quite a conventional officer background. Um, he grew up in um, uh, Kens South Kensington, you know, quite a well-off background. Uh, he was a pre-war regular, so he joined the army before the war. He served on the Western Front. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for gallantry under fire at the Battle of Arras. But he was posted to Ireland in 1919 with, with his battalion of the, of the Royal Welsh. Um, and he was commander of a camp 
um, in a place, well, near a place called Butt Event, which is in far west Cork. But in April, uh, and he was also an intelligence officer, in April 1921, he was captured by an IRA unit as he got off a train in Blarney, which back then was a, a, quite a small village just outside Cork City. And essentially what the IRA unit was trying to do was to use him as a, as a hostage because a number of their comrades had been taken captive or had been you know, imprisoned and were, were due to be executed. And the, the, the bargain that they hoped to strike was, well, if you release our comrades, we'll release, or if you don't execute them, we won't execute uh, Major Compton Smith. If you do execute them, he will be executed. Ultimately, the IRA prisoners were executed and he himself was executed then by the, the IRA unit. But they, they held him captive for almost two weeks before they did this. And he wrote two letters, or at least two letters, uh, before he died uh, on the day of his death. And I, I just want to read you brief excerpts and we can perhaps go to the audience then. But the, the, to me, these are very revealing. Um, so he wrote these two letters, uh, his captives took them and they were, they were captured in Dublin in one of Michael Collins's offices. Um, in the first letter, which he wrote to his wife, he said the following, I'm to be shot in an hour's time. Dearest, your hubby will die with your name on his lips, your face before his eyes, and he will die like an Englishman and a soldier. I cannot tell you, sweetheart, how much it is to me to leave you alone nor how little to me personally to die. I have no fear, only the utmost, greatest and tenderest love to you and my sweet little Anne, that's his daughter. I leave my cigarette case to the regiment, my miniature medals to my father and my watch to the officer who is executing me because I believe him to be a gentleman and to mark the fact that I bear him no malice for carrying out what he sincerely believes to be his duty. He leaves a second letter to the regiment. I'm just going to read you a brief excerpt from it. This is what he says to his comrades in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. I intend to die like a Welsh Fusilier with a laugh and forgiveness for those who are carrying out the deed. I should like my death to lessen rather than increase the bitterness which exists between England and Ireland. I've been treated with great kindness and during my captivity have learned to regard Sinn Féiners rather as mistaken idealists than as a murder gang. Now, to me, that this is striking for a couple of reasons. Thank you, Isabel. And um, I'm not sure if that point of view was especially representative. Certainly men who were executed in that fashion, that wasn't very common. Um, you know, it happened a number of times. It wasn't, there wasn't the typical way that the few hundred British soldiers who were killed over there died. But this man had served on the Western Front. He was awarded at the DSO. By the standards of his time, he was a war hero. And by the standards of our own time. And yet, because he wasn't killed in France or, or in Belgium or in one of the theatres of the Great War, him and people like him are forgotten. There, there simply is no place for them in popular memory in Britain. I mean, really whatsoever. And what's striking to me is that, you know, in Britain, we tend to, uh, understandably in some ways, we tend to revere the dead of the Great War. We see them invariably as heroes. And there's a lot of emphasis on remembering, you know, remembrance with a, with a capital R. There's a bit less, there's somewhat less emphasis, I would say, in understanding. And what to me is striking about the British officers and men who were killed in Ireland or who served in Ireland in 1920 and 21 is they really complicate our understanding of that generation of the Great War. You know, and, and looking at the campaign they were involved in, some of the atrocities, at least some of them were uh, complicit in, to me, you know, it gives them back their humanity. You know, our ancestors are rarely all one thing or the other. They're not villains or heroes. They're usually a combination of both. That's particularly true of servicemen, of soldiers in wartime. So to me that, you know, the, the dead of the Irish War of Independence, you know, um, cast the generation of the Great War in, in a different, but not necessarily more negative light. Uh, lovely way to finish your bit. Let's go to the audience. Um, so please do uh, keep adding questions. We've got some good questions that have already come up. I'm going to try and group some of them together uh, for Edward. Um, so let's let's have some that are about uh, uh, the British Army in Ireland at this period. So um, Cassidy asks, I've, I've heard that the British Army was more, more respected and generally better regarded by Irish and British people alike compared to the Royal Irish Constabulary and other uh, local units. Is this true in your point of view? Yeah, listen, that's a good question. And I would have said, even in, you know, in Ireland growing up, there was this sense that, oh, well, the British Army weren't especially involved in you know, the terrible atrocities committed by the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. 
What, what I would say is that that popular memory persisted, at least partly because so many Irishmen had served in the British Army uh, and, ha- and had respect for their former comrades. I mean, they, they definitely did. However, and this is this is very revealing, if, if you look at the research by O'Curran and, and O'Halpin, which, which only came out last year, it's, it's an excellent book, and you look at you know each death, death by death over 20 and 21, quite a significant number of civilians were killed by soldiers. You know, they were killed by army personnel. So definitely the, the, the balance of really nasty behavior was committed by the, the paramilitaries and especially the auxiliary division who were ex-soldiers rather than serving soldiers. But, you know, the, the, the army were complicit too. I would say though on balance, yeah, the, the reputation in, in Ireland and especially in Britain was much more positive. I mean, I think during this period and striking, you know, the, there's a sense in Britain in, in the press discourse in, in the commons that it's really, it's the black and tans, it's the auxiliaries, it's these unruly temporary gentlemen during the war, you know, they're not from good stock. <laughs> you know, it's not the officers and the gentlemen of the, of, the, of the regular forces who are committing atrocities. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, so another thing. So Andy asks, do, do the speakers think that many Irish soldiers who served in the British Army during the war would have been treated uh, better by the general population and by the Free State if there'd been a peaceful settlement in 1919? It's a good counterfactual question. It, 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 yeah, it, but it's a tough one to answer because what that supposes is that they were particularly badly treated by the Free State in the 1920s, which isn't actually all that accurate. I would say that there were definitely instances of army veterans who were very poorly treated, particularly in rural Ireland in the years after the First World War. There's no question about that. And there's no question either that service in the IRA was regarded with much more esteem and respect generally than purely service in, let's say, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers or some regiment of the British Army. But actually, you know, um, Armistice Day was commemorated throughout the 1920s. More poppies we know were sold in Dublin in the 1920s than in Belfast. You know, uh, huge war memorials were put up in, in Irish cities and, you know, housing estates were built for ex-servicemen. There's even an argument that recent research suggests that Irish ex-servicemen, Irish veterans were better treated by the state than their English, Welsh or Scottish counterparts. So it's it's a complex story. You're, you're right to suggest that there, there was a problem, particularly in places like Cork and Kerry, where there was a lot of nationalist fervour. But there was just so many ex-servicemen that, you know, real antagonism just wouldn't have... There was far many more ex-servicemen than ex-IRA men, you know, so they were somewhat outnumbered. And, to, and a new state to be established with all of the compromises and uh, yeah, knitting together that required. Absolutely. And some, something, excuse me, I should, I should really highlight is that a huge number of the men who had served, let's say, in the Royal Dublin Fusiliers or the Connacht Rangers or these five key regiments that were disbanded in 1923, went and joined the Free State Army. And that caused a bit of ill feeling, actually, that it seemed that, you know, experienced men who had weapons training and served in the Great War just seemed to be taken en masse into the Free State Army rather than men who would purely serve in the IRA. Thank you. Um, OK, so we've got a, we, there's a there's a whole set of questions that I'm going to group together. Uh, well done, everyone who's asked them, because they're great. Um, about uh, uh, both about the, the war and about its memory. So uh, if I was to knit them together, it's something like, is, is, it, was this an unpopular war? But the fact that this is an unpopular war uh, in Britain, does that, meet, does that contribute to it being ill-remembered? So does it, go into, does it go into the memory hole straight away because yeah, it's I think, too difficult to talk about? I, I think it's a good question, definitely. I, I, you know, something that um, I think William Sheehan highlights is that if you look at the regimental histories, that were published throughout the 20th century, let's say up to the 50s and 60s, but especially in the interwar period of regiments like the Essex Regiment, the, you know, the Leicestershires and the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, the, the Scottish, a number of Scottish regiments and the Gordon Highlanders, for example, they barely mention the 18 months or nearly two years that at least one battalion would have served in Ireland. Some of them don't mention it at all. And some of them kind of give it a paragraph or two of the Sinn Féin rebellion. And that to me suggests that in military terms, it wasn't very proudly remembered. It wasn't remembered as something that, you know, men looked back on in the way that they looked back on, let's say the retreat from Mons or the Gallipoli campaign or, or the Somme as something that they, awful though those events were, 
they were proud to have served and, and to have survived them. And for the regiment to, you know, they, they were battle honours. Whereas, you know, battle honours weren't really won in, in, in Dublin or Tipperary or Cork in 1920 and 21. So there's a official amnesia. It's, it's a good question because actually the press is full of this. There's a real discourse. There's a real conversation about Ireland in 20 and 21. But I think, go, yeah, going forward, it, it just doesn't fit with the national narrative in Britain which is that, you know, British servicemen defend the world from, you know, defend civilians and vulnerable communities from people like the Germans. And they don't commit those sorts of atrocities themselves. And I think that, I think that's an element of it. Thank you. And just, just one, one last answer, uh, question and answer. So if you were going to reflect this from Lanell, if you were going to think about the, um, the centenary, uh, what would you have liked to have seen? That the of, the, of, of the Great War? No, of the uh, of the Anglo-Irish War. Well, um, I look, there's a number of things. I, the, my issue with the centenary of the Irish War of Independence in Ireland is is sort of the same as my issue with the with the centenaries of the Great War in Britain and elsewhere, which is that th- this was a this was an opportunity to really begin to understand ourselves and. Um, in Britain and Ireland and elsewhere, that was that that has essentially been missed. The inescapable context of all of this is empire and colonization and decolonization. Now, the, using the term grand narrative is is, is not very fashionable in, 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 in historiographical circles these days. But you know, I remember hearing Jay Winter say something like this years ago. But if the grand narrative of the 19th century was empire building and colonization, the grand narrative of the 20th century is the loss of empire and decolonization. And for the British, that process begins in Dublin in 1916. Now we can argue about Ireland's status within the United Kingdom during that period, but the fact is that even though it is a victor of the Great War, it loses a a significant, about a fifth of its territory, its home territory in the aftermath of the war because of the War of Independence, because of this IRA Sinn Féin campaign. I encourage people in Britain to pay attention to Irish history, not because, you know, I want some sort of special pleading on behalf of Ireland or because I think it's interesting myself, but so that they might better understand their own history, the, you know, the, the history of Britain, which is inescapably a story of empire, at least in the early part of the 20th century. And I think looking at Ireland, you know, helps fill in that picture as much as any other incident. 